We're looking at a passage. Uh, we're just standing. Why we stand is just we're honoring the words of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, uh, starting at the first verse. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And then picking up at verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the carob pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. For what the father said to his servants quickly, Bring the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he, heard, he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received them back safe and sound. And he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never even gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you're always with me. And everything that I have is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. Thank you for this story, uh, this parable, the proud of the often titled. And I pray that you would uh, use the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. In your name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. <coughs> so, there he was, standing in the middle of the pigsty, <coughs> holding a carob pot in his hand, a crucial ingredient of the pig's lap. It's really an appetizing piece of vegetation. And yet he stared at it longingly. And he wanted to fill his stomach with as many of these things as he possibly could fit. He remembered at one time when he and his brother were kids, his brother dared him to eat a carob pod, and these things are disgusting. They're like these long, brown, four to six inch, wrinkly, hard as nails pods and then if you do manage to bite into it, right, then you, you bite into it and there's this mealy, sinewy substance that smells somewhat of Limburger cheese. And he bit into that thing and it was disgusting. <laughs> Learned it the hard way how awful it was. It was unfit for human consumption, but for right now, it was his best option. He looked down and he caught his reflection in the water trough. Get here. Ragged clothes, dirty face, messy hair, penniless, homeless, desperate. He thought back to his home, back to when he was growing up, back to when he was a kid. Now he and his brother, they'd always be competing with each other, always vying for best spot, and he always would come in second place, always trying and never succeeding. Even in Hebrew school, 
Um, whenever he was trying to memorize something, whenever he was trying to recite that memorization, recite that verse, that part of the Torah back to the rabbi, he'd always get it wrong. His brother was just so good at memorization, he was just so terrible at it. And whenever the rabbi heard him recite, he would say, Ach, if only you were more like your brother. There was a time that they, you know, competed. I mean, their father, they, they had a, they had an estate, they had, they grew wheat. That was their trade, that was their crop, and they had a wager that they would uh, beat the other with a better crop. And they had the same land, they had the same thing, they had the same resources, and yet, despite all of that, he came in second place again. If a shlemiel is somebody who, has, who often spills his soup, and a shlemazel is a person who has, his, has the soup spilled on him, he was both, it seemed like. And increasingly, he just grew to feel like he was a lousy son. Scratch that. He was a lousy human being. He was a good for nothing. I, I, can't, I can't succeed in anything. I'm not good enough. I can't impress anybody. I mean, everyone in town respected his dad. Everyone in town respected his, 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 his son, his brother. And everyone saw him as the exception. So why bother? Why bother with trying to keep up appearances? Why bother with trying to uh, try hard? I'm done. I don't want to be in this family. I don't want to be in this town. I don't want to be me. And so one day, they're at the dinner table. The clinking of silverware, filling the silence. And he summons all of his courage. And he looks straight at his father. And he asks him for the unthinkable. He demands him. He demands his portion of the inheritance, which is is a really terrible thing to say because if you're demanding your inheritance. It's it's rather odd to get your inheritance before your parents die. So he was saying essentially that he was wanting the premature death of his father. He'd rather have his stuff, rather have his possessions, rather be done. His brother scoffed with disbelief. His baby brother had finally lost it. But his dad just looked back. Not in anger, not in frustration, but it was just sad. And he hadn't expected anything good to come out of this. Hadn't expected this to go well at all. But what his father did next astounded everyone in the room. He asked for the papers, and he asked for a pen. He was going to draw it up and give over his share of the inheritance and split it between the two of them right then and there. As soon as he signed it, that was that. Those papers were like a ticket to freedom. Finally, he didn't have to be in this house. Finally, he didn't have to be uh, a brother. He didn't have to be a son. He didn't have to be anybody. He was free. Finally, to do whatever he wanted. So snatching up everything and swallowing that last bite of his dad's cooking, he left the room. The following day, he went to the bank, liquidated every single one of his father's assets, and then he got out of Dodge. And as he rode out of town, everyone stared at him with disgust because they knew exactly what had happened. What did he care? He was gone. He didn't have to come back to this town for anything. And so he rode. Lost track of time, lost track of distance. He was in a far enough country. Languages was different. He was just wherever he, wherever he wanted to be, he was, he was there. He was a blank slate, and a blank slate with a ton of cash. He had plenty of money to spend, and he figured, he'd never seen that money in his li that much money in his life, and he figured that with this much money, I wouldn't have to work another day in my life. No, he didn't. He just spent it. Spent it like it was burning a hole in his pocket. He was spending it on anything, anything that his heart desired, anything that he wanted. He, he bought it. He got a house in the Mediterranean Sea right on the beach. He always thought, man, that would be nice a house on the beach, a really big house, too much space, but he had it because he had a lot of money. He ate sumptuously every day, partied every night, did whatever he wanted to do, and then finally in the midst of everything, that money that was a fountain slowed to a trickle. And around the same time, so did the economy. A famine came, perfect storm. And he opened that safe in his now empty house because he sold all the furniture just to try and get a little bit of cash. And he saw in that safe just a single roll of bills, less than $1,000. 
He had no intern, he had no friends. Anyone that he had run with had just been using him for his cash. No one really cared about him in this place. He didn't really, he didn't know the culture, didn't know the language, and so the house was repossessed. He found himself completely destitute, almost with nowhere to go, nowhere to turn to, and finally after begging a job for on the street, just from somebody, from anybody, just, just give me some work. I need to have some kind of cash to survive. Some goyish pig farmer hired him. And there he was, standing in the pigsty, considering on which end of the carrot pod to bite. And then it dawned on him. The people who work for my dad, they're paid well. People who work for my dad, they have four, three square meals a day. They don't want for anything. And in fact, there's probably far enough that this economy crash didn't affect them whatsoever. And for the first time, he considered actually going back. But then he remembered what he'd done, how his neighbors looked at him, what it would mean to actually go back. And then suddenly, one of the few Hebrew verses that he was able to memorize from the Torah came flooding back to him. And there was this passage that the rabbi had always used to terrify the kids, and it worked because it was memorized right there, locked in his brain. And it was this passage from Deuteronomy, and it went like this. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders of his city at the gate, at the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall, of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Now, he didn't know if that had actually happened in recent memory. But if there was ever a situation where that might happen, this would warrant that. And so he had two choices, A or B. A, I could go home, I could die here of starvation and pigsty eating a carrot pot, or I could risk it on choice B and go back home and risk stoning by an angry mom. I'll take my chances with B. But he knew he couldn't return home as a son. He knew he wasn't worthy. There's no way he was worthy. No way that he was even close. So maybe he could just hire himself out as a, as a servant to his dad. Certainly not be able to ever pay off this debt, not ever be able to pay off this relational debt, but maybe he could get close. And so he figured he'd just aim low. He'd get down on his knees, he'd crawl in the dirt, and just be on the dust in front of his father and say, keep it certain sweet. Father, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your higher hands. So that was that. Late that night, he got up, stole as much from that goy farmer that he could, and he walked away as carrying as much bread as he could carry. Now for his dad, what his son had requested that night, it almost killed him. Not from rage, there wasn't frustration or, or, or malice, but he was racked with sorrow. He didn't know if he was ever going to see his son again, but he never gave up, never lost hope. But then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. Not a word. Dead? Prison? Slavery? I don't know. He had no idea. But he still didn't give up. When his son had left, he cleared out everything from his room except for the mattress and the box spring. And there were suggestions that they could turn that room into something like an office or whatever, but he never, he never, he never relinquished the room. He always thought, I just want this here just in case he comes back. Just in case, I don't want it to be touched. I want it to be ready. So people stayed away. His brother tried endlessly to just get his dad to move on. Like, he's, he's a good-for-nothing son. He, he's gone. He's dead to this family. Just move on, Dad. It's good that he's gone. But it wasn't good that he was gone. Every single morning and every single night, he'd step out to the porch, and he'd look out, down the road, just in the hope that maybe he'd see his son. 
Maybe he'd start walking up the road and he'd run to him and he'd hold him. And it took a long time. Then one evening he stepped out and he saw what looked like a bum making his way up to the house. But he squinted, he stared, he, he, he concentrated and there he saw his son. he come back. His heart jumped to his throat, tears streamed down his face, and he just screams from the porch, My son's back! And he starts running down the road. He throws his arms around him. Near tackles him. Grabs his face in his hands, starts kissing his face. He's just so overjoyed, so delighted that he's back home. And meanwhile, his son is completely unprepared for this. Angry mob, pitchforks, rocks, absolutely. Not for hugs and kisses. I was not ready for this. And it overwhelmed him. And he tried to get the words out. Dad, 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 I, am, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But it didn't even seem to phase him. It didn't seem to affect him at all. His dad just had all this, this crowd had gathered from the fields around the road. And they, he said, go, get the finest robe that you can put on him. Get a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. My son is back. And they, they scurry off, and soon before he knew it, he was decked out in the finest clothes he could wear. He called out, let's celebrate. Kill the fattened calf. We're going to have a party tonight. Because then he looked down at that moment, made eye contact with his son. He said, for my son is back. The night fell. The party was going great. Drinks were flowing. Music's going. DJ's great, cranking out some great tunes. But he scans the room and there's somebody missing. His older son. And so he asked one of the workers who was in the field with him that night where he was at. And so the worker said, well, I, I, told, I told your son what happened. I told him that your, your, your younger son, his little brother, had come home and that he was he received him back safe and sound. And so we were celebrating. We were having a good time. He just, he just turned around and just seemed really angry. Went to the barn. And so, the father went out to the barn. And there he saw his son sitting on a bale of hay, drinking a bottle of beer. Boring a hole into the ground. Just staring hard. He sat down next to him. I'm looking for you. I'm wondering where you're at. You won't believe this. Your, your younger brother, he's back home. He's here. He's in the house right now. We throw a party for him. Everything. All, everyone's here. All the neighbors are here. We're, we're having a good time. He had to come over. Isn't that incredible? Now, come on. Get, let's get a plate of food. Son. Talk to me. What's wrong? What's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong, you crazy old man. I've been working for you. I have slaved for you every single day of my life. And this good-for-nothing, rotten son of yours comes home having wasted every penny you've ever given him. And you kill the fattened calf for him. I've slaved for you every day. And you never even gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And you give him a party? I'm not coming in. I'd rather die before I came to that party. Son, everything I have is yours. Every single acre, every animal, every crop, everything that we have is yours. You don't have to ask. You don't have to earn yourself a goat. Just take one. Take five. Have a party. I love you. You don't have to impress me. You don't have to work for me. You... you if this is all yours, you're my son. But so is your brother. We thought he was dead. He's alive. He's alive. We thought he, he was completely lost, but he's come to his senses and he's, he's found. He's back. Isn't that worth celebrating? Come on. Come in. Get you a plate of food. So the story ends. Now this is a really loved parable of Jesus, and it's one that's often described as the parable of the prodigal son. 
which makes a lot of sense because it's a, a lot of emphasis is spent on that. But prodigal, let me define that really quick. Prodigal is defined as spending money or resources freely or recklessly, just like the younger son did. But it's also defined as having or giving something on a lavish scale, like the father did. Now, it makes sense to call this story the prodigal son, but I like the prodigal father better. Let me explain. If you call the prodigal son, we might extract from the story the moral that we ought not be like the prodigal son. We, we shouldn't be this spendthrift individual who just wastes all the money, you know, we go wild living. We need to come back and like be obedient to our father, be obedient to God, and actually uh, serve him. That's, that's the moral of the story. But if that were to be where we landed, that would be to miss the point. That would be to miss the point of this story, because... Jesus is telling this story in response to something. We read it in our scripture like, reading this morning. In Luke 15, it says in the very beginning that tax collectors and sinners and reprobates of every kind were gathering around to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees audibly grumble that he's letting them do that. He's letting these people come to church, as it were. Because they would have thought, they don't deserve this. They don't deserve the love of God. They haven't earned it. They haven't earned the, the honor of being in the presence of a rabbi. And it's that idea. The idea of deserving God's acceptance. Being worthy enough in his sight to be able to come into his presence that Jesus wants to respond to. And it's that idea of worth and worthiness that the brothers in the story actually both have in common. As, as at first glance, we would look at the story and we think, man, these are two totally different characters. But if we look in a little bit more, we can see something that shows that they are far more similar than they are different. Obviously, we see in the younger son, the sinner who's asking for his inheritance. He goes and blows it all on his wild living. And then he comes back. But note when the father responds to the son, he responds with giving him what he's asking for. This is a request that could have cut him out of the family entirely, would have just cut him off right then and there, no inheritance for you, but he gave it to him. And that's a move that Jesus' original heirs would have counted as spendthrift, as prodigal, reckless, that gesture of love. And so when the prodigal son comes back after doing this, he, is, he believes his sin is so egregious that it has eliminated his identity as a son, which is a fair assumption. And as a result, what he believes he can do is become a hired hand of his father and essentially make himself a slave to try and make it up to him, earn that relational debt back, earn the cash debt back that he owes his father. And really at the core of this, he believes he can earn his father's favor. He believes that he can earn it back, probably not in full, but by maybe working hard enough by, by putting his nose to the grindstone, then he, he can actually earn his keep and simply be in his father's presence. But if you notice, that's exactly what the older son is doing. So while the younger son's welcome to the house of the party, the older son's sulking in the barn. And why is he sulking? The main reason, his main complaint with his father is that he's thrown a party. He's given him a party. He doesn't deserve a party. He doesn't deserve the best party. He, does, he deserves nothing. I deserve a party. I have worked really hard for you. Why didn't you give me a party? That's his main complaint. And what he says about this betrays how he's perceived of himself all these years. He's slaved for his father is what he says. He doesn't see himself as a hired hand. He doesn't see himself as a son. He sees himself as a slave. That's what he is. And he wants his father's stuff. He wants his father's blessings. He wants his father's acceptance. So it's, in essence, his belief is the same as the younger son. He believes that his worth can be earned, that his father's favor can, can be merited. And so we see that internally there's no difference between them at all. The younger son believes that he could never be considered a son because of what he's done. And on the other hand, there's the older brother who believes that because of course he deserves to be called a son, because of look how hard I've worked. And yet both sons hold the same belief that the father's favor, love, and acceptance is earned. 
and they failed to realize that they already possessed what they wanted. The younger believed that he, he was himself too far gone. The older believed who has earned his place, and they were both wrong. The elder brother failed to realize that he already had what he was slaving for, so-called. And the younger brother failed to realize that his identity didn't depend on his behavior, no matter how heinous. And both of them represent two ways of coming to God, deriving a sense of enoughness. And Jesus' point is that your place in the Father's house depends solely on his prodigal and unconditional love for you. No matter what you've done. Because here's the thing. God doesn't care what you've done. God doesn't care how often you've done it. God doesn't care who you did it with. God is always on the front porch looking for his younger sons and daughters. And he's always going to search the barn for his older sons and daughters. And this transcends the Christian framework, by the way. So whether you're secular or if you're a religious person, we all possess the mindset of a younger or an older son. We all have within us a pursuit of enoughness, a pursuit that is shaped by either pride or by shame. And whether that pursuit takes the form of wealth, of happiness, of sexual fulfillment, a, a good, happy marriage, a, a, a thriving family, or success in some form, in some way, the point is that we all try, that's not how we get into the house of God. That's not how we enjoy the fullness of life that God desires for us. Because God wants you in his house, and it's not because of what you bring to the table. He doesn't want you there because of how worthy you feel, or how good you are, or how well you've lived. God wants you in his house simply because he wants you. You're his son. You're his daughter. And that is a title that is neither earned nor lost. It's a title that is given to you. Identity, worth, and acceptance and his blessings are given. They are not earned. And that's why I believe the parable of the prodigal son should be called the parable of the prodigal father. Because against all expectation, the father always responds with prodigal, reckless love in every circumstance. And at great cost to himself, God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, to love you and forgive you on the cross at Calvary. And that's where it's demonstrated the highest. He was crucified and killed so we could have a relationship with him. God, Jesus was rejected so that you could be accepted. His worthiness was transferred to us and our unworthiness transferred to him. Or he descended into hell so that you could ascend to his place in heaven with the Father, in his house. That's what the cross does. That's what Jesus does. The cross humbles us because it reveals that our sin and our self-righteousness is far more insidious than we could ever have ever imagined. And at the same time, it raises us out of our shame because we realize that we are more loved than we ever dared hope because God the Father has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die willingly on my behalf. And as a result, the prodigal love of the Father invites us into a party, into a celebration, he welcomes us to the table, and I think that George Herbert's poem, Love Three, beautifully captures this invitation, and I want to conclude with it. Love made me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew near to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, Worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, the ungrateful. I, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand, and smiling did reply, Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, Who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Let's pray. God, thank you that you've invited us to your table, not because of what we've done, quite often in spite of what we've done. Thank you for your love, for your unconditional acceptance of us. No matter where we're coming from, whether we're the older son in the barn or the younger son coming up the road from a life uh, of brokenness and, and, and shame, God, we 
ask you to invite and invite us to the table and, and let maybe feel welcome, Lord. And for anyone in this room who's feeling the burdens of, uh, of the weight of this world, um, thank you for serving us at the table. In Jesus' name, amen.